I didn't write about it in my book. I'm saving it for my next book, but there's many versions of the story online. Um, yeah, I was living in New York when Nirvana played their very first show there. And I'm friends with the Sub Pop president, John Poneman. And he said, go see Nirvana. They're playing their first show and uh, at, at the Pyramid Club. Maybe 100 people, 120 people were there, including Iggy Pop was there. And I really liked the show. Uh, they weren't my favorite band in the whole world, but I thought they were very cool and I was very proud of them for being from Seattle. And then for three days, I kept passing them where they were staying. They were always out sitting on some steps in New York City, drinking beer and smoking cigarettes. And so on the third day that I passed them by, Kurt said, hey, are you from Seattle? And I never met him before. Someone must have told him or John Poneman must have said to look out for me or something. And I said, yeah. And he goes, do you, uh, do you play guitar? I said, I play keyboards and guitar. He goes, what kind of guitar do you play? I said, I use a lot of echo and make really spacey sounds like Pink Floyd. And he goes, oh, that's cool. Uh, we're going to England and we're just getting rid of one guitar player. Do you want to, you want to join us and come with us? And unfortunately, the story goes that at that time I had a very bad drug problem and I couldn't see leaving New York City because my little life was only a six block walk back and forth from my house to the dealer's house. And I knew that if I got on an airplane and went somewhere else, I was going to be in trouble. So I said no. And also I, I thought I'm working on my own music. I don't want to be in someone else's band playing their music. One more part of the story. After In Utero, Nirvana played a thank you concert at a small club in Seattle. And only people were invited were their friends and family and bands from the Seattle scene. I got invited because I was with Sky Cries Mary. And I go to the Crocodile Cafe and I see Kurt with his like leopard, fake leopard coat and sunglasses, just drinking alone at a bar. And I walk up to him, I said, hey, Kurt. And he kind of like, yeah. I said, I have a, just a question. Do you remember in 1989 asking me to join Nirvana? And he looked at me and goes like, no man, sorry. There was this kind of underground vein of creativity that maybe started with like the Velvet Underground, maybe sometimes the Doors, uh, Iggy Pop. It was this kind of immediate physical expression rather than a highly polished expression that was made to sell lots of units of a product and you know just generate money. So I think that Green River was a return to a kind of like more guttural, uh, primal expression in music, but that had also been in Seattle's sound for a long time. It just it never really got popular until Mud Honey and Green River and um, Malfunction and Mother Love Bone, all these kind of bands brought this new aesthetic back. Um, yeah, so yeah, Green River was very important because it led to like Pearl Jam and it led to Mud Honey. Uh, very cool people, very young, of course, at that time as well. The grunge scene was one of the last scenes where nobody had a cell phone, nobody had a computer, everything had to be, you were just in your parents' basement, bored out of your mind with your friends. All you had to save your life was a guitar and an amplifier, okay? So the kind of creativity that came from endless amounts of time and boredom and anger and frustration I think that's very different to everybody these days that can just kind of, when they feel bored or anxious, they can just push a button and print and they can lose themselves in, in this thing, in the internet and in uh, social, you, you feel more connected. And in those days you felt very isolated. I think that's one thing. And certainly at the beginning of grunge, Seattle had a long history of no matter how good you were, how talented, you're never gonna go anywhere. You know, you're just making music for yourself and for the 60 people that come to the Vogue on a Thursday night, the one place in town that had original music. So you weren't expecting to fly in a private jet. You weren't expecting to be able to buy a house one day. You were just trying to make music because you had to, okay? And then in 1989, something very special happened. Seattle bands got to travel first to New York and then to, England. And this was like, what? 
you could play music in Seattle and now go touring in England. This is like a world of difference. So I think this was a very interesting time and one of the last times to make music in the whole history of the world without cell phones or computers. I think there is a grunge influence on like say the Strokes. Even, even when I was talking to them near the end of Is This It, I just mentioned that, oh, you know, I know Pearl Jam because I worked with Stone and Jeff when they were kids. And Julian's like, oh, we love Pearl Jam. So it's like something about the urgency and the power of that expression, I think went into some of the early OO's music too. Moldy Peaches, Strokes, Interpols, yeah, 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 LCD sound system. There's an explosion of energy and raw power coming out that I think that people are afraid of now. They don't, they want to look cool. They want to look more polished and more professional. But I think in those days, there was a great value on just exploding emotion out of your body. And I think that's very, very important. And I think it's a little bit missing in today's music, but people really respond to it when they see it. My band Sky Cries Mary played on one of the jam pack bills. I think Bjork played, uh, Chris Novoselic's band, Sky Cries Mary, and many other big bands of the day played at this festival. I think polit politicians uh, who were sympathetic to the liberal causes were very happy to have someone that used to be in Nirvana speaking up and gathering young people to register to vote. That was another thing, rock the vote and rock against racism. Those were all things that were happening in the 90s and I saw it myself in Seattle. So I don't know if, uh, especially another thing, that since we, there's no internet in those days, we don't have that reaction like all these right-wing politicians jumping into the public eye on their own platforms to condemn anything they don't like. It was much slower. So I don't know about any backlash. And I certainly don't think anybody in the music community held it against Chris for becoming politically active. They didn't go like, that's uncool. Nobody said that. Even as a child, 10 years old, I was very motivated to pay attention to music because there was a feeling in the air, now this is going back to Beatles, okay, that we were about to change the world with music. And that appealed to me very much. And it also got me very interested in political protest. In my part of the world in Seattle in the like, late 60s, there was a big thing protesting against the treatment of Mexican farm workers in California who were harvesting grapes. So I was out there with signs in front of the shopping market. And there's also the feeling that the Vietnam War was wrong and people were protesting that. It was in the music all over the place. It was in the underground. We had underground newspapers, very well done with great art and very smart people, okay? So I was very motivated by the idea that music was leading a movement to change the world, okay? Now, my feeling like a lot of people's probably at the time when it didn't quite happen. I mean, we were all pleased when Nixon got booted out of office, but we realized that, boy, there's a lot of powers going on in the world and a lot of people in every country that kind of believe what the government says and they feel the same way. And so I think a lot of people, including myself, felt like the power of music and good thoughts and creativity on a certain level, it doesn't seem to be able to change the macro picture of the world economics, ecology, uh, violence, racism, sexism, uh, all these things. Like, it's like, well, it's not exactly changing. You know, it doesn't really work. In fact, some of these things are just keep spiraling and getting worse and worse and worse till you have Donald Trump and his followers and, you know, storming the Congress building to, you know, all this stuff, okay? So maybe I, my idea is that spiritually speaking, every time I create something, I have to have the faith that it's gonna resonate with somebody out there who might take a spark. And that person who I don't even know, I don't even know where they are, they could hear a piece of music 
or read a poetry or hear one of my words and start working on something that could really help or that can spread a certain vibration, okay? So I think that the expectations and the focus has changed, but I think the magic power of actions and creativity are still there. What I see mostly, like say take someone very important, like Arlo Parks, okay? Someone is representing a maybe oppressed or underheard community. And that community responds with a lot of love and a lot of support. And this artist has a great career and a great chance because they have touched a nerve with a lot of people. And I think part of the problem of staying neutral is that you might miss some chances to connect with audiences. And of course, whatever you come up with politically that you want to create from has to be something that you live in your life. Like it would be strange of me to say, to start like putting a lot of trans rights lyrics into my music. It's like, what is he doing that for? Just to become popular because he's never spoken about it before and he's not trans and he's not in a trans community. So I think it has to be genuine, but the political uh, movement, I think in music is now very community based. The beginning of grunge, like there was a, there was more like a creative political revolution at first, because if you look at the bands that were in power on MTV, there were these highly manufactured metal bands with really poofy hair and hairspray, your Cinderella's, your rats, your uh, skid rows. This was the dominant theme. And along comes scraggly face Kurt Cobain and his torn jeans and just playing his guitar. And suddenly all those people are irrelevant. Like they can't even work. They don't, nobody's thinking about those old wave of bands instantly. So I think the first political change happened from like a fashion and a sound and a more genuine kind of music. This is a very, this was kind of political. It wasn't governmental political, but it was uh, creativity and cultural political, okay? I don't think when Alice in Chains was making music or Soundgarden, I think they were thinking about making the coolest music ever. I don't think they were really thinking about, we've got to do more for the government and we've got to give underprivileged people more rights. But later, People like Chris Novoselic, he got very politically active when he was now had money and he had a reputation. Well, he started having rock festivals and bringing the biggest bands together in Seattle to fight, to do things in Congress, to do things in state government. So it actually took until a little bit later, say 96, 97 ish, you know, for real political involvement to get in, get into the grunge scene.